Welcome back to Christian Discipleship 101, where we are talking about those foundational principles for walking as Jesus walked, these foundations uh, that we find in God's written word in uh, the Bible. I hope that this uh, series has been uh, effective for you and thought-provoking at least. And by the way, time is just really passing by. Because we're on lesson 12 now. We've been doing this for 12 videos um, so far. It doesn't seem like that, but uh, time flies whether you're having fun or not, right? So uh, today let's talk about lesson 12, which is one of my favorite topics. Again, we're building on these foundational uh, building blocks that we've already laid down regarding Revelation and the Trinity and, and redemption, salvation, who is Jesus, who is the Holy Spirit, all of those foundational things, we continue to build on those. And today we talk about the church, the church. Now, I could talk for a long time in this video about the church, since that's really where my training and education is. But uh, I'll try to kind of condense it and keep it in a nutshell for us uh, today. But let's talk about really what the church is. What does the Bible say? What does Christ say uh, regarding the church. Because sometimes I think in our present day and age, uh, we use the term church, but it, it's like where people are talking about two or three or four or five or a hundred different things. So what does the Bible really say um, about the church? So what do we mean, first of all, by the term church? Well, in the Bible, the word church is actually a very simple term, and I love the way the Bible puts it, especially in the Greek. The term church, or at least that we get the word church from in English, it comes from a Greek word that means that is called ekklesia, ekklesia. It's a very simple term. In fact, it's two words that have been in Greek put together. One word is ek or out of, or out from, and the term uh, kaleo, which means to call or called out for a specific purpose. So the term church, really, when you get right down to the biblical nuts and bolts of it, it's a word that means the called out people, the called out ones, um, called out for a specific task. In other words, the church is not simply some religious entity. It's not just, hey, these are a group of people who uh, get together every Sunday or Saturday or Friday, if you're Jewish, or Friday night. So uh, these are not just people that get together and uh, do religious things and kind of go through these rituals and motions and, and that's the end of it. No. No, the church is the called out ones. We're called out by God. We're called out by Christ for a specific purpose. We're the called out ones. We get together on purpose, not just for rituals, uh, but we get together on purpose because we're called out by God's spirit. The church also then is not an institution, although, although it's easy for the church or local churches to become ossified calcified institutionalized it's you know this is it's in concrete it's my way or the highway uh, very legalistic sort of thinking the church is not meant to be that but sometimes we in our just our cultural makeup and who we are as fallen human beings we do that with the church but that's not what it's meant uh, to be in the bible the church is this organic called out people of god for a purpose. So we're the ecclesia, the called out ones. In fact, the church is an organic entity that grew out of the redemptive mission of Christ. That's from theologian W.T. Connor. I really appreciate that, uh, that statement. This is a grassroots thing. This is the movement of the Spirit of God who's put all of these really diverse people together who've been saved by God's grace through faith. He's put us together and called us out to be about the redemptive mission of Christ in the world. That is just incredible to think about. 
We're a part of Christ's mission. His spirit indwells us, fills us from every corner of the globe, every different kind of person there is. Those who are saved by grace are called out to be on this redemptive mission together, not only at a global level, but also at a local level. All right, so let's get more specific then than that. What are some of the essentials uh, that the New Testament says you need for uh, a church to function? What is a church really supposed to look like? Because we all have uh, probably a lot of ideas that have been shaped and molded in our lives and in our experience over the years about what a church really is or ought to do or should be. So what does the Bible really say about that? Well, if, if you get down to its most basic component, the church is composed of people who have been saved by grace through faith. Now, at least in the Baptist tradition, this is what we mean by church membership. It's not like joining Sam's Club. Uh, you know, you become a member of this. It's not like subscribing to a YouTube channel. It's like, oh, I kind of like those ideas, so I'll press the subscribe button. No, church membership is different than that, okay? It's not like you have this, uh, you, you you get the secret handshake and learn the secret knock when you get into the church. Uh, it's it's uh, way different uh, than that kind of thing. No, the, we are just people who've been saved by grace. Um, there's nothing magical or super spiritual about uh, about church members. We are just people who are saved by grace and we are a part of, committed to this local congregation. All right, that's a church member. I'm committing to this certain local family of faith and I'm going to share my gifts and use my gifts to edify this church family and uh, to follow the spirit here. That's That's what church membership really is. So the church, especially at the local level, it's composed composed of people who've been saved by Jesus, saved by Christ, redeemed by Christ. And we get together out of all of our diversity to edify, to fellowship, to do ministry, to do the Great Commission together. Now, there's uh, different metaphors that the New Testament uses to describe uh, who people in the church really are. Um, and these are wonderful descriptions. In fact, probably the most prominent metaphor in the New Testament is a metaphor that Paul used at uh, various and sundry points. He called the church the body of Christ. That's a wonderful way to think about it. Uh, we are the, the body of Christ. Christ is the head. He's the brains of the operation, right? And we uh, all are attached together. Uh, we're not split off from one another, but we're attached and we're in motion. We're doing the, uh, the work that the spirit of Christ has put inside of it. So the church in the New Testament sense is called the body of Christ. And there are different words used to describe church members, okay? Some uh, some New Testament authors refer to Christians or church members as saints, um, which is really an inclusive term. Right? It's not just these super spiritual guys or, or women in some cases who have done like these extra spiritual miraculous things. No, if you're a if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're a part of the the sainthood, the priesthood of all believers. Sometimes in the New Testament church members are referred to as brothers and sisters. This gets to the idea that we are adopted children of God, that we are part of the family of faith and so we're related um, spiritually as brothers and sisters, even though we may be very far apart biologically, we're related spiritually. And then the New Testament also refers to Christians or church members as co-laborers. In other words, we're in this work of the Spirit together. Nobody's on their own. There's no Lone Ranger Christianity. We're in this thing together. Now, another thing to remember that's essential about the New Testament description of what a church is and what a church does is this, that the work of the church is spiritual in nature. And by the word spiritual, I'm not talking about this, uh, I'm just drifting off into the spiritual to contemplate the universe. I, that, that's a different kind of spirituality. When I use the word spiritual, I'm speaking in the biblical sense of spirit-led. That's what spiritual means in the Bible, is that it's focused, whatever we're doing is focused on 
the Holy Spirit and what the Spirit of God is leading us to do. That is spiritual, all right? So in other words, the work of the church is to be spirit-led. We're not in this thing called the church to make a profit. In other words, the church is not a business. Uh, the church is also not a social club, uh, which, by the way, nothing wrong with a business, nothing wrong with social clubs, right? Those are worthwhile things to be a part of. I can be a part of uh, a group that's uh, a, a social organization that's putting together a, a, a Christmas toy drive or something. Like, nothing wrong with that at all. But the church is not that. The church is spirit-led. We're not just confined to um, getting together and just trying to do good things for other people. No, we're based in the spirit of God and what God wants to do. So the church is not a business. It's not a social entity or club. It's certainly not a political camp. There's a lot of political diversity, supposedly, in, uh, in the church of, of Jesus Christ in the world. Um, so our focus is to be spiritual. We are uh, saying, God, what do you want me to do? We know you're at work in the world, and we want to be a part of that work. And so we pray to the Holy Spirit, God, show our church uh, what you want us to be doing, um, because we're we're not here just to uh, get some cash, and we're not here just to do a couple of good things every year and call it good and just get together on Sundays. We're certainly not going to try to be some sort of political organization to uh, uh, create some sort of cultural chaos. We're here to do the Spirit's work, all right? So this church is a spiritual organization or organism. Baptism and Lord's Supper. Let's talk very quickly about those. We're going to save most of our energy for talking about baptism and the Lord's Supper for next time we're together in Lesson uh, 13. But baptism and the Lord's Supper are what are called ordinances. Ordinances. Now, that's kind of a fancy theological term that may sound a little vague to you, but the word ordinance refers to uh, something that is commanded uh, instituted by Christ himself as a practice uh, for the church. And these two ordinances have a very deep spiritual meaning to them. And so we'll talk a lot more about those in our next time, in our next video. But this is an essential of New Testament churches, that uh, they are composed of baptized believers Baptism is a very essential thing, not to salvation, right? We want to make that caveat, and I'll talk a lot more about that next week. But baptism is not essential to salvation, but it is a it is a symbol. It's a mark of obedience for the believer. So we'll talk a little mo more about that in our next video, but that's an essential of the New Testament church. We also see in the New Testament that the Bible is authoritative. Uh, for the people of God, and uh, the, the the process by which the Bible came into its uh, what we call the canon, the the measurement of really what's in and what's out. That that was a very uh, spirit led, uh, prayerful, uh, years and years long process. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in another video. But the Bible is authoritative for the people of God. In other words, one of the first questions we ask, or at least we're supposed to ask as church members is, well, what, what does Jesus say about this? What, is, what does the Lord say? What, what, what's recorded in his revelation to us? So what does the Bible say? That needs to be one of the first things we ask about anything that we do as a church or any ethical quandary that we may get into. The Bible is authoritative. And then last but certainly not least here, becoming a Christian and a church member we see in the New Testament is voluntary. It's not to be coerced. Now the church and churches have really gotten this wrong over the years. And I think uh, as we take even a cursory, cursory glimpse at church history, we'll see that uh, a lot of times people were coerced into becoming Christians. You know, there was sometimes a drive among uh, certain missionaries to say, you know, you need to be a Christian or, you know, we're going to, uh, bad things are going to happen to you. That That is not a New Testament, <laughs> a New Testament principle. Uh, proselytizing by the sword uh, never does turn out well, right? Um, so in the New Testament, though, we see that 
uh, this is a non-coercive group. We're, we're not out to make people believe just like us or make people Christians because we can't do that. Um, becoming a Christian is a free will choice. So we're not out to coerce. We're certainly out to convince, but not to coerce people. So becoming a, a member of a church needs to be voluntary and no coercion involved in what is a deep, deep personal matter of the soul, between the soul of a person and God. All right, let's keep going. So who's in charge of the church? Who's in charge? That's a, that's a great question that's even debated hotly today in Christian circles. Who's in charge of this thing? Who makes it run? Who, where does the buck stop? Um, well, in asking that question, I would respond by saying this. Instead of talking about who is in charge, it is better to describe who is serving. All right, this is a really different way of looking at organization and government and structure in a church. All right, in our kind of American concept or westernized concept of who is in charge, we very much still today have this sort of top-down approach, don't we? It's like you draw yourself a triangle, and at the top, you know, there's there's God, and then right under God, there's the pastor, and then right under the pastor, maybe there's the deacons, and there's this kind of um, uh, hierarchy that's built in, and it's very rigid, and 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 we can't get away from the the rigidity of that, and it becomes calcified. Um, that's more of a westernized creation of how things ought to work than it really is seen in the Bible. In fact, the kingdom of God works on a totally opposite direction of that, doesn't it? You just turn, you turn the triangle upside down in the kingdom, right? Jesus says the first shall be last and the last shall be first. So it's better to talk in the church about who is serving, where do I serve? Um, everybody has a voice. So there's not this hierarchy of I've got to do exactly what the pastor says or the priest says, otherwise I will be kicked out and stomped on and, and all of that. No, it, it, that, that's not the New Testament perspective. We would say Jesus is in charge, all right? Without trying to be cliche about it, we would say Jesus is Lord. He's the head of the body. We're all just a part of this body, okay? But we're all in this together. We're all serving. Everybody has a voice. Everybody is called to serve. However, I would also say this in the same breath. The New Testament does talk about leadership in the church. So there is leadership among church families, the church body. And these leaders are to be about at what's called edifying the church, not ruling over the church. Like the Apostle Peter said, pastors are not to rule over other peoples. That's how, that's how things work in the, in the Greco-Roman world. Um, in, the, in the westernized concept of things, you have one person at the top who sort of dictates the rest to everybody else. That's not the way it's supposed to work in the church. But there is leadership gifted leaders. And the New Testament outlines in a beautiful way what leadership is supposed to look like in the church. In fact, in Ephesians 4, this is probably the clearest we have um, of, the, uh, of the leadership um, applications in a New Testament church. Paul says there are apostles, there are prophets, there are evangelis evangelists, and there are teachers. And these people uh, have different gifts, obviously, and these leaders are to cultivate a sense of edification and fellowship in the body to complete the work of ministry. He says that these folks are to equip the saints, to equip the believers to do the work that the Spirit has called them to do. So it's describing who serves. The leadership structure is not top down. It's Jesus to us and through us, right? That's the, the structure of the New Testament church. All right, so let's talk just a little bit about what these exact leaders do, all right? Well, as far as apostles are concerned, it's really debatable about whether apostles still exist. Now, some people in other den denominations who are very much just as Christian 
and cry as spirit oriented as I am, all right, would highly disagree with this and say there are still um, apostles in the church. In fact, a number of years ago, I preached at a, a men's conference with a, another pastor who used that term. He was uh, he, he called himself an apostle to different uh, churches in his specific denomination. And hey, we can agree to disagree on that. Um, he was a powerful, powerful preacher and man of God, nothing against him or his denomination. We just see that a little bit differently. But from the New Testament perspective, it's sort of debatable whether apostles still exist, because back then, apostles were people who had direct, uh, a direct encounter with Jesus Christ um, in a very visible, tangible sense. These, these were the guys who walked around with Jesus. John the Apostle said, we are the, we are the ones who physically handled him. We embraced him. We shook hands with him. We, we looked him right in the eye. So they had that, that uh, initial experience with Christ that uh, we, uh, 2,000 years later, don't have. Right? They had that physical um, encounter with Christ. And that gave them some great authority in really casting the vision and implementing the Great Commission vision in those early churches. These are the guys who turned the world upside down, these first apostles, this great uh, visionary way of looking at church and uh, how the church encounters the world in an abidingly relevant uh, way. All right, prophets, who are they? Prophets are people who uh, are leaders in churches that uh, uh, tell forth God's word. These are folks who, um, even when it's hard to speak a truth, they can speak the truth because God's laid it on their heart. Um, and it's a truth that will edify. It's a truth that will bring about power and goodness and uh, encouragement in the body. You know, a lot of people today think, uh, prophets are, are like fortune tellers, and they look through their little crystal ball and say, well, God's going to do X, Y, and Z in the year 2025. Well, that's really not a prophet. That's just kind of hocus-pocus religion. Prophets are those who speak the truth of God, and that truth is always, always, always going to be in line with the Bible. Uh, it's not going to divert from the If you're truly spirit-led, you're not going to divert from what the Word of God says. So prophets tell forth God's Word. Evangelists, they're kind of like our modern-day missionaries. These are folks who have a great way of telling the good news of Jesus Christ in ways that different and various cultures can understand and grab a hold of. Evangelists. And then teachers, very much today the same as they were back 2,000 years ago. These are folks who can communicate insightfully about knowing and doing the will of God. These are leaders in the church. Now, the New Testament also talks about a significant, what we would call office or leadership office, a special set-apart area of church life for a church leader called the office of pastor, all right? That's, that's what I am, right? I'm called to be a pastor. Now, what does that mean? Well, in the Bible, the word pastor is used interchangeably with different terms. And again, other Christians of different denominations, we may find some disagreement here on the significance of each of these terms. But from my study and my background, the word pastor is synonymous with these other words in the Bible. They are elders, shepherds, and overseers. Now, let me briefly tell you what those words mean. The term elder means a pastor who uh, is uh, at a point in his or her life where the experience is there and the wisdom is there and the age is there. This is an elder. It's an older person. I've read some, uh, this is kind of funny, some translations of the term elder that mean long bearded one, uh, somebody who's had a long time to grow their beard, right? And that means they, they have a lot of wisdom. It's kind of a fun term. Uh, there are elders, elder statesmen, elder pastors. These are the folks who have that experience and that wisdom for many years who can stand up and say, church, family, 
uh, this is the way that we need to go. Uh, because trust me, I've gone down this other path before and it hadn't been good. So let me let me lead you and give you some help, especially you younger ones. That's what an elder does. Shepherds, these are very self-explanatory. Shepherd the flock. Feed the flock. Keep the flock away from wolves. Keep wolves away from the flock. And then overseers, sometimes that word is called bishop in the New Testament or episkopos. It means someone who scopes over the crowd, who sees from the 35,000 foot level and can tell the forest uh, from the trees. All right, so general duties of pastors in the New Testament, uh, giving congregations teaching, preaching, feeding them, over giving oversight in spiritual matters. Uh, when there are questions that come up related to spiritual things, this is what we need to be thinking about and doing and how we can get at this complex problem uh, through the leadership of the Spirit. And also in guiding the activities of the church, making sure the church doesn't become a business or just a social club or something or a political party or something like that. A, a pastor is responsible for giving leadership in those areas. Now let's keep going. A couple more slides to go here. Uh, let's keep talking about who is in charge. Now another leadership office in the New Testament church is what is called the office of deacon or the diaconate. Now this was uh, the earliest uh, remnant of teaching we can find about deacons was actually the formation of deacons or the diaconate as we find it in Acts chapter 6. There was a great conflict in the church over a food distribution ministry that was happening at the time. And the church said, hey, I think it would be a really good idea if we called out some people uh, to take a special note of this conflict to help ease it and also to give leadership and to be servants uh, in this role. So that's really what the term deacon means in a New Testament sense. These are people who give spiritual care and pastoral care to local congregations. Paul talks a lot about deacon qualifications in 1 Timothy chapter 3. I would highly encourage you to look at, uh, at that passage. It gives great insight on uh, Paul, what he says. Hey, this is, this is what you need to look for in your church when you're looking at who can be a deacon or who can be a pastor. Um, these are some qualifications of people who have this great leadership and servanthood uh, quality. Um, but again, that leads to this question, but really, like who is in charge? Again, where does the buck stop in the church? Well, Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. But how then do churches make decisions? Well, New Testament evidence suggests to us that churches are to be democratic in nature. In other words, churches, uh, every Christian, if they're a saint, if every Christian, if every believer is a priest, which I believe they are, as I interpret the scripture, then every church member has a voice, all right? So church members have a voice in the direction that the church goes. The church has a leadership structure for sure, but at the very basic level, the church is to discern, to pray together, and to know the will of God and then to do it together. So it's a democratic process. We get together and we say, how is the Spirit leading us? And we discuss that. And then we make a decision and move forward. So churches are democratic. They are self-governing. But in the New Testament, we see this as well. Churches are highly cooperative. You know, I think sometimes churches that are self-governing and independent and democratic, they, they tend to use that in a way that removes themselves from other churches. And, and that can be really like we're this church out here on an island and we've kind of got it all figured out. And we don't need you and we'll just do our own thing. That's not the New Testament model that the churches are democratic and self-governing. But we see in the New Testament that churches were highly cooperative in missions and in ministry and in their giving. That Paul was always going around saying, hey, let's, let's take up an offering for the poor in Jerusalem and their saints who are suffering there. And he would go all over churches in the Roman Empire uh, gathering support for these 
cooperative effort. So churches are democratic, democratic self-governing, but also very, very cooperative. Now, what are some examples that shows us that the church is democratic in nature? Well, in Matthew 18, when Jesus talks about uh, how conflicts are between believers should be worked out, especially in very complex matters, he says that we ought to, at the end of the day, go to the church if that conflict cannot be solved at the personal level. In other words, if you have a problem with another Christian, go directly to that person. If you can't work it out personally, get uh, get somebody to be an arbitrator in that conflict. And if that can't be worked out, then go to the congregation. The congregation has a voice. Acts chapter 6, we just talked about this. When the first deacons were approved, that happened with congregational input. Uh, some of the apostles went to the church and said, hey, we think we need to invite some people to help work this ministry out. We're having a lot of conflict here. And uh, what do you think about this idea? And the Bible says that the congregation was very pleased with this. They, they, it resonated with them. They had some input into all of this. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there's a really hard issue that the church has to deal with uh, that Paul addresses in uh, 1 Corinthians 5, a, a really awful ethical issue that was happening in this church. And Paul gives them direction on how to handle this. And he doesn't do it. This is really telling. Paul doesn't help them solve this issue by saying, well, I'm the chief authority in this and I'm the apostle and you've got to do what I say. Paul didn't do it like that. He, he helped solve this issue by counseling the church in its own decision making. In other words, he, he kind of takes this approach of, you know, if I were one of you, this is how I would respond to this. It's a great way of, uh, of doing pastoral leadership. Paul doesn't come down as a tyrant or a dictator. He comes at the issue and says, listen, I see that this is a big problem. Now let's deal with it. Let's work the problem uh, together and we will uh, find a solution to it. And then lastly, but, but certainly not least, what is the mission of the church? And then why are there so many denominations? Well, the mission of the church is really clear. Jesus gave it to us in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go into all the world, to all nations, all tribes, all speaking groups, um, race, color, creed, doesn't matter. Go to all of them and make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Trinitarian God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey all that Jesus has commanded us. That's the mission of the church. This involves then fellowship or edifying each other, building each other up as a church, also promoting righteousness or rightness through our behavior. In other words, Christian uh, Christianity is to affect all modes, all spheres of our life. We are to be engaged in doing the work that Jesus did, social work and uh, loving our neighbor and whatever is good and right and honorable and true. Our minds are to be set on these things and our faith is to be worked out in love. And we cooperate then with the Holy Spirit as the Spirit leads. And then finally, uh, I want to touch very briefly on this, and we'll get into it in, in uh, uh, following videos, but why are there so many different kinds of churches and denominations? Three things come to the fore here. One is that there are different biblical interpretations. I told you about my pastor friend just a moment ago who was of an apostolic tradition who thought that there was still apostles in the church, and that's part of just his uh, biblical interpretation. I don't want to take away from that. I just interpret the Bible a little bit differently. And so there are different denominations because of different Bible interpretations. Sometimes there are also cultural and political factors that go into to why churches um, set themselves up in different ways. And also you'll see in church history, that as uh, as churches have as the church big C church and little C churches have developed, that there is this tension between the church and the state. A lot of times, the church 
wants to coerce what's happening in the state and the state wants to coerce what's happening in the church. And out of that tension, there comes different denominations. Uh, and again, much more on this in following uh, subsequent videos, but I uh, wanted to make sure to address that today uh, in this video. All right, so that's lesson 12. That's a snapshot of the church as we see it uh, outlined, defined, and given credence and power in the New Testament. So next week, we'll get into lesson 13. We'll start talking a little bit more about the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper. And I look forward to seeing you then. And until then, have a great, uh, great week, great day, and we'll see you later. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.